Members of Council, if I can please have you take your seats. May I please have quiet in the council chambers? Members of Council, can we please rise for the national anthem? Please remain standing, and during this time, please remember the following persons who have passed away. Michael Cograss, Bruce Fleury, John R. Gardner, Ann Johnston, Mavis Barbara Knowles Phillips, and Jordan Vera. Thank you. <clears throat> we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat's people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations. Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefits of those who are connected to the internet, the City Clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. Members, we have three presentations this morning. The first is to recognize Chris Brillinger, Executive Director of Social Development Finance and Administration, and I would like to call upon Juliana Carboni, Deputy City Manager, to come forward for this presentation. Uh, Madam Speaker, I just want to acknowledge the family of uh, late, the late Councillor Ann Johnson, who's sitting here in the public gallery today. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Speaker, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for this opportunity to thank and recognize a long-standing, devoted and passionate uh, leader within our Toronto Public Service. For 31 years, Chris Bollinger has played an integral part in helping build and shape our city and our public service. He started as a career some years ago as an urban planner in the nonprofit sector before joining the then Metro Toronto government in 1988. I believe it was, as a community development officer. Now, I know for a fact that when he joined public service, he only intended to stay for a few short years and then return to the nonprofit sector. But lucky for us, a few short years translated into 31. 31 years that he's dedicated working diligently and in partnership with council, others of us across the Toronto Public Service, community agencies, residents, and stakeholders in furthering social justice, equity and inclusion, and helping build a city and a Toronto public service that's recognized globally for its diversity and inclusion. 
Under his exemplary leadership, Social Development Finance and Administration, SDFA for short, is uh, regarded across Canada as a leader in its innovative and sustainable approaches to community and social development. Chris has led and made so many tremendous contributions on countless projects, initiatives, and priorities. Everything from the work that he's done leading the transformation of TCHC, known as Tenants First, the poverty reduction strategy, equity responsive budgeting, uh, anti-black racism, strong neighborhoods, all his work with youth and the youth equity strategy, the list goes on. And throughout it all, he's always remembered and stayed focused on what's important. Listening, and I mean truly listening to residents, communities and stakeholders, working in partnership with others, respecting people and their many diverse views, and bringing those diverse views together to form sustainable, innovative approaches to the many challenges that the city and the public service face. On a personal note, I'm going to miss his wise counsel and guidance, his caring and strategic leadership, but I look forward to working with him as he continues to advance, help us advance the city's social inclusion agenda in his new role as Executive Director of Family Service Toronto. Chris, know that you have built such a strong, solid foundation upon which your small but mighty SDFA team will continue to grow and flourish. They can continue to build on your many successes, your contributions, and your advancements. And you should be very proud. I know that you have some of your friends and family here joining us today. And to all of you, I want to say thank you for sharing Chris with us and for your role in supporting him during his time here at Council. Okay, I'm almost there. <laughs> on behalf of countless of us across the Toronto Public Service, our community and the Toronto community, I know how much you love Toronto, we say thank you for all of your many contributions and for your commitment, integrity and uh, leadership and we wish you all the best as you finally re-enter the nonprofit world and continue to work with us. We wish you all the best in this next chapter of your career, Chris. Mr. Mayor. I don't know what I can add to that, Chris. And by the way, how, how often do you see that happen in here, Chris? So you should take that as a mark of the respect and uh, affection that people have uh, for you and for the work that you've done. And I just want to say uh, on behalf of the elected representatives, but also on behalf of the people uh, of the City of Toronto, really going just uh, beyond what uh, Juliana said, thank you uh, for a job well done. Uh, the, the regard in which this government is held and the services that it provides and the way of life that it helps to uh, try to foster is a direct, uh, a direct consequence of the hard work and uh, ingenuity and imagination and determination of public servants as well as elected representatives. And I have seen uh, all the things that Juliana talked about even in my relatively short time here. A couple of the things that she mentioned, uh, uh, one of which is before the City Council today, uh, that being Tenants First, the Poverty Reduction Program and countless other initiatives uh, bear the mark of your hard work, of your uh, absolutely unwavering commitment to uh, equity and social justice uh, and, and uh, uh, incredible uh, dedication to public service and compassion uh, in particular for some of the most vulnerable people uh, that live uh, in the city and the neighborhoods uh, in which people live across the city. And so um, I think today it's fair to say that because of your 31 years of work that we have a stronger and more resilient city and I think that that's what we're all seeking is a stronger, more equitable, more resilient city. And so I just want to uh, really say as, as uh, the cherry on top of the very excellent um, summary given by Juliana, thank you uh, for a job well done. Thank you for uh, setting an example when it comes to public service. Um, and while we regret the fact that you're uh, moving on, uh, you're not going to be far away, as you've pointed out, in the context of some of the very same issues that we will now deal with as partners, um, as I hope we have done uh, during your time here. But you'll be a partner not far away uh, doing your good work at Family Services. Um, as you know, it's kind of like the United Way and many other great organizations. We can't 
uh, offer you even a gold watch or a new car, um, but we do have a scroll that carries with it some of these words that have been spoken by Julianne and myself, uh, which uh, indicate our deep appreciation for your public service. And maybe Julianne could come up and we could have our photograph taken together with uh, Chris and, and uh, 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 present this to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Juliana, for those kind words. And thank you, Council, for the opportunity to serve my city. It has been a great pleasure, my great pleasure and honour. My advice has been consistent and constant over the 31 years. In a city as unique and extraordinary as Toronto, social economic inclusion must be at the core of everything we do. To do otherwise would be to miss the point. Some examples of council direction that stand out for me from an inclusion perspective are the creation of the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Strategy and Unit, resetting the city's approach to the city's 58,500 social housing units, and Mayor Tory's personal leadership on the resettlement of Syrian refugees is another excellent example. Going forward, the continued development of, the, of an equity lens embedded in the city's annual budget process is perhaps the best example of how to move a city motto to city action. I have had, I, I'm thankful for having had the opportunity to work with amazing colleagues in the Toronto Public Service, uh, equally amazing external partners, and most importantly, Torontonians from every corner of this city who have a care for their Toronto. There are no words, Kopira, uh, to convey my respect and appreciation for each and every staff member in Social Development Finance and Administration Division, a small but hugely impactful group of dedicated public servants. I've had the great fortune to work for the most talented supervisors. My first boss in government was Shirley Hoy, uh, Eric Gam, Nancy Matthews, Sue Cork, Joe Panachetti, and Brenda Patterson. I don't use the word hero lightly or often, but it most certainly applies to my colleague, my friend, and boss, Juliana Carboni. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Chris. Um, our next presentation is to recognize Valerie Jepson, Integrity Commissioner, upon the completion of her term of office with the City of Toronto. Mayor Tory. Well, Madam Speaker, um, this is not a job anybody would take on uh, with a view to winning popularity necessarily. It's a difficult <laughs> job. Um, and just as we talked about the importance of public servants and elected representatives and sound public policy, fair, equitable, compassionate public policy in paying tribute to Chris, 
Um, it is also, of course, extremely important that the uh, people look at their government here at City Hall and see a government that is founded on a commitment to integrity. And I want to, uh, on behalf of all members of City Council and on behalf of the people of Toronto, thank our Integrity Commissioner, uh, Valerie Jepson, for her dedication and her service and her hard work on behalf of the people of the City of Toronto. Uh, ethical leaders set standards, uh, model appropriate behaviour and hold everyone to account. And uh, Valerie Jepson, as Integrity Commissioner for the past five years, has provided ethical leadership, thoughtful advice uh, and education uh, to the members of City Council and myself as Mayor, encouraging the highest standard of ethical conduct. The Office of Integrity Commissioner has become an integral part of what I think has been an increasingly important accountability framework, which I think is respected uh, across Ontario and across the city. I think it is respected most importantly by the people who live uh, here in the City of Toronto, and I think it is appreciated as something that is a very important part of maintaining confidence in government. And if you think about it for a minute, uh, even with events occurring right up to this moment, uh, the maintenance of confidence in government and confidence in the leadership of government in the people, the elected people and the public service, uh, where that's being called into question all over the world, I think we're doing fairly well and have to continue to do even better uh, at making sure that we maintain a more stable confidence-building environment here at City Hall, and you've helped us in that regard over the past uh, five years. And what that helps us to do, quite frankly, is then to keep a focus on government as an instrument of good, uh, which I think we believe it is, as opposed to uh, other things that might uh, distract us. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the fact that during your time in office, uh, you have been awarded the 2018 Society of Ontario Adjudicators Regulators Medal, and that you've been recognized as a University of Victoria Faculty of Law Distinguished Alumnus uh, in 2019. Uh, these are uh, external uh, recognitions of your hard work and dedication, uh, and they're accompanied, of course, by a contribution that you've made uh, right here at City Hall to the well-being of this government and its civic democracy. And so uh, we thank you uh, for a job well done. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing what you're going to do uh, going forward into the future. And uh, just like Mr. Brillinger, we can't offer you a new, well, of course, in your situation, you'd be utterly unable to accept a gold watch <laughs> or a new car. And so, in light of that, we're going to give you the same scroll that everybody else gets with thanks for a job well done. To the Mayor, City Council, the City Clerk, the City Manager, thank you for this recognition. I am a bit uncomfortable with these kinds of personal recognitions, but I have to say it is in line with the beauty of this place sometimes, so I'm going to go with the flow this morning. During my term, I've tried to be a good steward over the Office of the Integrity Commissioner, a task that has been made so much easier because the office is so well entrenched in the fabric of the city. When it appointed the first Integrity Commissioner, David Mullen, the first Municipal Integrity Commissioner in Canada, City Council did so voluntarily as a way to demonstrate to the electorate that it took oversight seriously. Notably, Commissioner Mullen was appointed almost exactly 15 years ago today. Speaking of Commissioner Mullen, let me take this opportunity to thank my predecessors, Commissioners Mullen, Sawson and Leeper, who were invaluable supporters to me over the course of my term. I also wish to thank my fellow accountability officers. A somewhat lonely job has been made a little less lonely because of the collegiality and professionalism of this wonderful group. I am also indebted to my staff over my term and I'm most recently ably assisted by Caroline Tenier. I thank Caroline for all of her help. The staff and city clerk's office deserve special recognition for the support provided to my office over the term. I'm thinking in particular of the staff in Council Support Services, Financial Planning, Clerks IT. I'm grateful for the independent collegiality that I've been able to have with the City Clerk in particular, with the Deputy City Clerks of the City, the City Solicitors that have served during my term, the able members of City Legal Services, and the City Manager's Office. I'm looking forward to the next chapter for me, 
to meeting the new integrity commissioner and helping that person prepare for their role. But I will miss this job. The part of the job that I enjoy the most is the advice giving. And as it was when I joined, the City of Toronto remains a place with a strong culture of advice seeking. And I thank the members of council and, its and the City Council's boards for seeking advice and guidance and in so doing showing your good intent to live up to the code of conduct. I'd like to take this chance to acknowledge two sets of unsung heroes. First, the hardworking economic partnership business advisors in the BIA office. If there is a single area for which I have gained the most appreciation, it is for the exciting and important work of the city's BIAs. These volunteer boards do a lot with little, and they are very ably guided by the talented economic partnership advisors in the BIA office. I thank that group of city staff for their steadfast commitment to the code of conduct and to my office. The second group of unsung heroes, and there are many of them in the room today, are the talented and professional staff in, in the mayor's office and the councillor's offices across the city. My old boss, the Ontario Integrity Commissioner, taught me that the secret to educating and helping elected officials meet the standards of conduct is to make sure that the staff can help them when they need it most. Nowhere is this more true than here in Toronto. I am so often impressed by the dedication, attention to detail and care that the staff of members of Toronto City Council are served by. Thank you to all of you City Council staff for the help that you provide to members of Council to meet the standards of conduct. Your efforts and quiet dedication have been noticed. I'll wrap up by saying it is a strength of our system in Toronto that the Integrity Commissioner's term is limited. The term limit is good for the City, good for City Council, good for the office, and according to my spouse who's here today, it's good for the office holder and especially for the household of that office holder. <laughs> On a more serious note, thank you again for this recognition and for trusting me to serve in this role. As neutrally as I can, I assure you that the Toronto City Council, its boards, commissions and agencies, its public service and its accountability framework will always have a goodwill ambassador in me. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our last presentation is to recognize City of Toronto employees, agencies and Toronto Island residential community for their response to the flooding on the Toronto Islands. I would like to call upon Councillor Cressy to come forward for the presentation. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, amidst record high water levels this year, uh, and admittedly some touchy moments, the islands were kept not only open but safe. And so I'd, I'd like to join all of you, as well as Mayor Tory, in recognizing and thanking city staff from Parks Forestry and Recreation, Toronto Water, Stratcom, the Office of Emergency Man Management, as well as staff from the TRCA, and a pretty dedicated group of, of island residents for all their hard work. If they could rise so we could give them a round of applause, all of them together. So, as you all know, the Toronto Islands are a rather special place within our city and for everyone in our city. There are 700 people who live there, there are 30 businesses, two schools, and 1.5 million annual visitors. That's more than the CN Tower every year. The islands truly are a citywide destination and an asset, and I would note for all of us, they actually produce 20% of our drinking water. And so in 2017, as you'll recall, record water levels forced the closure of the islands. It was a hard time. And this year, because of a remarkable effort, and a lot of measures that were put in place in advance, that didn't happen. 45,000 sandbags, 30 industrial sump pumps, 12 aqua dams, 60 city staff working on 24-hour shifts, along with 30 TRCA staff, a community that was filling sandbags day and night, 
And I have to tell you, Chief Pegg from Toronto Fire, when I called him and said I needed some bodies to help fill sign bags, he sent over 40 fire recruits. A calendar is being made because they were pretty spectacular. This was truly a team effort. Um, we know, as it, looks to, as it relates to the future, that what were once 100-year storms are now happening every other year. And that, with accelerating climate change, nobody is immune, whether it's Montreal or Bracebridge or Ottawa or Toronto. And so an annual sandbagging effort isn't the long-term solution, nor can it be. The climate may have changed, but the location of our neighborhoods have not. And so whether it's Woodbine Beach or neighborhoods in York Southwestern or the Toronto Islands, the answer is long-term resilience and adaptation. Uh, but that's for another day. Today, uh, as the local councillor, I just want to extend my deepest thanks to hardworking staff from the City of Toronto, from TRCA and the local community for protecting what is truly a gem in our city. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I will only add to that uh, our thanks to Councillor Cressy, who did his job as uh, the local councillor and uh, was very much in evidence this year. And I will say that um, I was there both, of course, two years ago and this year. And the preparation work that was done uh, this time, based on learning that came from the experience we had a couple of years ago, uh, made a big difference. And what you saw over there each time you visited uh, was a real partnership. And it was a real partnership that Councillor Cressy referred to as between the various uh, departments and staff members of the city, uh, including uh, organizations like the fire service. You saw that partnership with the TRCA. It's actually quite a remarkable uh, partnership there because they have the scientific expertise and the conservation expertise and so on to advise us what's really going on uh, with the water because that's a hard thing to sort of figure out. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the residents. Uh, the residents were understanding, they were hardworking, they were uh, partners very much with the city staff and it's one of those places that I've gone both times, both last time and this time, um, and heard more compliments uh, per capita for the city staff and the work they do from residents and of course in our line of work we sometimes don't uh, hear that as often. Uh, the only moment uh, 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 that to call that into question was the moment when I mused just for a second about seeing if we could expropriate uh, one of the very nice cottages that looks right at the city as a mayor's summer residence and that did not go down well. But I want to say uh, to all the staff and to the residents, thank you uh, for uh, learning the lessons of two 2017, applying them with a lot of hard work in 2019 and making sure that a situation that could have been worse because the water levels were worse, uh, in fact wasn't worse and that uh, that jewel that uh, Councillor Cressy referred to continues to be that and will be there for people this summer and for many summers beyond. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Layton, I understand that you want to make an announcement. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I wanted to draw Council's attention to the fact that the City of Toronto has proclaimed Friday, August 16th of this year as CNE Day. And this is the opening day of the, 19, of the 2019 CNE. I know we have a number of CNE associate board members and staff in attendance to, uh, today, and I rise as the CNEA Municipal Representative for the Executive Committee to welcome the following directors. CNE Association President John Carew, CNE Association First VP, Chair of External Relations Committee and former City Councillor Suzanne Hall, CNEA Director, Committee Vice Chair and retired broadcast journalist uh, Jackie Perrin, along with other members of the CNE External Relations Committee and staff. I well, let's give them a round of applause. I'd like to thank the CNE for putting on such an excellent event uh, the, in past years and what will sure to be an excellent event in the coming year that brings so much excitement to our city, including employment for many, many youth in our city. Uh, my council colleagues and I, who are appointed to the CNE board, would like to remind everyone to go and visit the fair. Join us at the opening ceremonies uh, August 16th to celebrate CNEA Day. Let's go to the X. Oh, baby, let's go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you, Councillor Layton. <laughs> yeah, not for the singing, no. But he has the nerve, though, right? I would now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Carroll, you have a motion on the minutes from our last meeting. 
Yes, Madam Speaker. That City Council confirm the minutes of Council from the regular meeting held on June 18th and 19th, 2019, in the form supplied to the members. All those in favour? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about their reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tor, you have a motion to introduce the Executive Committee report. I do, Madam Speaker. I move that report from meeting seven, uh, the report from meeting seven of the Executive Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And uh, I will just say that uh, the, the most, I, I believe the highest priority item that we're dealing with arising out of that meeting is the uh, moving forward of the tenants first uh, report and uh, what I think are some very significant uh, developments that will be in the best interests of uh, the many people who call Toronto Community Housing home. Uh, in particular, I'll just draw attention to the fact that this uh, report, if approved, will result in the creation of a separate entity uh, to oversee 83 buildings that are designated as buildings for seniors. And I think this will allow us to do two things. One is to have a laser-like focus on the seniors as tenants and make sure that we are the best possible landlords we can be for all TCAT tenants, but for seniors. Uh, but I think secondly, it will better position us to form the kind of partnership we need to form with very, very strong and abiding provincial participation, I might say, um, with organizations like the LINs and others that can allow us then to not just focus on being good landlords for the seniors, but also focus on offering them uh, a wider range of wraparound services to take account of their particular needs uh, at the stage of life uh, that they're at. But I believe that what we're doing here, combined with a number of other measures that are in this report, uh, will move us forward. It's been a long process. Uh, sometimes you would say these things take longer than they should, but um, they're complicated. Uh, and they, the, the desire is to get them right. And so I'm very happy that we're at this stage now where we've actually taken some of these decisions that needed to be taken because the status quo for TCHC was not uh, an option that we could uh, allow to prevail. Uh, I'll just draw attention to one other item, and that is the uh, pedestrian bridge in Crescent Town. This is something in which Councillor Davis and now in particular Councillor Bradford have taken an abiding interest, and Councillor Bradford has picked up uh, the leadership role on that, but we're going to need here, um, in order to get this fixed in a timely uh, fashion, the cooperation of the private sector and the Toronto District School Board with oversight from the city. And really what this item on our report, on our executive committee report is about, is uh, ways in which we can more strongly perform the oversight role because I think it's uh, clear to us that while we uh, had something happen there that, thank God, happened without any injury or death, um, it could have been otherwise, and I think that there's uh, lots of lessons for improvement that uh, we have for ourselves and for the others involved in, uh, in, in uh, places like this, pieces of infrastructure like this uh, in our city, and I think this report commends itself to us uh, in that regard. And I do thank uh, Councillor Bradford for uh, the fact that he's taken an ongoing interest up to and including yesterday and probably today in making sure that we not only make those improvements but also get the bridge itself uh, back in shape so that we can make sure those kids and families have access to uh, the school and uh, to get across to where they need to go. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Holliday, uh, you have a motion to introduce the Audit Committee report. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting three of the audit committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Members, I'll draw your attention. There are 14 audit committee items on this agenda. Uh, like many of the other audit committee agendas, um, it contain a number of financial statements. You'll know that the package for that is about as large as the rest of our council package. Uh, but I see that uh, some, only one of those items has been held um, among the highlights discussed at the audit committee meeting uh, were a number of reports circling around outstanding audits. And what I'd like to point out to members is that we did have some hearty discussion about those audits that have not been resolved, that were considered by council in the past, that had been developed by this auditor or the auditor before her, and are sitting unresolved. And so what the audit committee did was uh, add some motions that required the respective management teams that are looking after those audits to come back to the audit committee to do some further reporting. And there was also a general discussion about a process that would, that would occur between management and the departments to manage and track outstanding audits. And we know that there are a number of them and some of them are quite lengthy in time. 
And I think that's the overall theme uh, that we're seeing is that there's been a renewed focus on outstanding audits by the audit committee. And we've been thinking about our role as the audit committee to oversee the impl implementation of those items and wrapping our heads around a process to keep track of them. Uh, what you may not see though, members, is all of those bits of information come to council every time. And so what I, I would encourage you to have a look at the subsequent audit agendas for further information on outstanding audits that may interest you or quite happily uh, speak to uh, myself uh, or the Vice Chair, Councillor Fillion. Uh, we can let you know what we know about any outstanding audits of interest. Um, one such item that did have some requests for additional reporting was an audit item that attracted a lot of attention and that was um, opening doors to stable housing and an effective waiting list and reduced vacancy rates will help more people access housing. In consideration of some of the other council uh, agenda items today with respect to Toronto Community Housing, this audit came at a very, very helpful time. Uh, members, if you have not read that audit or the presentations along with it, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it did provide an enormous amount of helpful information about how we as a city can better manage the list of vacant properties within TCHC and other housing providers and do a better job at matching people to those particular housing opportunities. I think that's really exciting. Uh, it represents continuous improvement by the city and I know that people are heading down the path of engaging on that type of work. Uh, and so just to wrap up, uh, I know there are items that are held. Uh, if it, myself as the chair or the auditor general can be of assistance or the vice chair to help get your questions answered so that we can move those items along, uh, please know that we're available to you to assist with that. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minnewong, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report. I do, that the report for meeting eight of the Civic Appointments Committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report. I do, and good morning, Speaker. That the report for meeting six of the Economic and Community Development Committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Speaker, there were 23 items that we had at uh, committee. I would just like to uh, draw members' attention to a few of them. Uh, the first one is the uh, community benefit framework. Um, Mr. Berlinger, uh, when he spoke this morning, talked about the need to ensure that social economic inclusion should be at the core with respect to what we do here. Um, this particular framework is attempting to uh, create uh, such opportunity uh, to utilize um, through a process where city contracts are awarded to benefit communities and so on and uh, particularly the at-risk uh, communities and members of uh, our city population who are primarily racialized who are not enjoying the largesse that exists for many in this city. It's an opportunity to help us to use uh, community benefits as, as leverages to enhance opportunity of prosperity for many who are uh, basically at risk in terms of being left behind in this great city. I would also like to draw members' attention to uh, um, EC 6.4, which is the Children's Service Report, and I know that Councillor Cressy, I believe, is holding that particular item which, of course, we'll get into further discussions a little bit later on. But this is a serious matter as it relates to childcare in the city. There are about 51 projects, uh, school-based um, childcare uh, capital programs that we were about to engage in with the province. It appears based on where we are with respect to our negotiation and discussion with the province that that may not happen uh, because there are some timelines associated with this particular requirement. Timeline is um, August 30th, and that's fast approaching. This report is seeking to amend that timeline to uh, perhaps to take it back to October, to put it to October, where further discussions can take place. There is a significant sum of dollars that are associated with this particular um, 51 uh, school-based uh, childcare uh, project. 
It's about $35 million, and we need the collaboration partnership with the province and certainly the schools. If we don't get that, it means a significant uh, problem and disadvantage for families. Uh, the numbers have been talked about. It's probably about 3,000 childcare spaces that would be impacted. And I think that's extremely important for us to recognize because that will have such an adverse impact on families and so on. The other area that I wanted to simply touch on, uh, Speaker, is um, EC uh, 6.13. Again, it's, uh, it's the issue around confronting um, anti-black racism in this city. It's 2019, and 2019, uh, we still face a situation where there's a tremendous amount of racism in this city. Now, this city is not unique. This is global. It's, 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 it is a problem. Being that we always talk about how this city is such a diverse city and how we're very proud of that, we need to do more. Uh, staff member Anania, uh, Anania Grant has done great work with respect to this issue, and I think it's important for us to ensure that we are going to pay some attention to this. There are a number of, of, of um, items that's dealt with in this area. It is about how we do things here within the context of City Hall, not so much of the broader uh, city. Clearly, we can use uh, and, and learn from this particular model. And the final item that, Speaker, I'd like to uh, just to speak to briefly is the Night Economy Report. This is a, a, a great report and it seeks to create an environment uh, framework where we can develop our Night Economy, which could benefit us to the tune of about $10.6 million annual. That's significant. There's a lot of uh, pieces of the puzzle that has to be brought together, transit, an issue around noise, impact, how we can light our, our areas in the city, making it safer overall and so on. And so the committee was uh, quite busy. I want to thank the staff for uh, all the work that they've done. General Manager Mike Williams is here with us. Thank him for his continued leadership on the economic development piece. Uh, the DCM, Juliana Carboni, thank her for her leadership. And thanks the folks from um, the community and social development piece speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ains, do you have a motion to introduce the General Government and Licensing Committee report? I do. Good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting number six of the General Government and Licensing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce Infrastructure and Environment Committee report? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, very much, Madam Speaker. The report from meeting six of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I would simply bring your attention to IE uh, 6.8, which is Vision 2.0. I won't comment on that. It's the Mayor's key item. As well as take a close look at IE 6.9, 6.10, Automated Speed Enforcement uh, that is on its way uh, with provincial, potentially pro provincial uh, approval. Uh, 611 cycling network plan uh, between 2019 2021 120 kilometers of cycling infrastructure is planned and another 70 kilometers of routes will be studied thank you very much thank you councillor bylaw you have a motion to introduce the planning and housing committee report Yes, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting seven of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda for Council be presented for consideration. And I'll just uh, uh, bring to your attention the fact that at the Committee we are um, uh, supporting the expansion of uh, laneway housing uh, to the entire City of Toronto, so excited about that. Uh, we also had the opportunity at the Committee to allocate provincial and federal funding for the creation of over 3,000 housing allowances. Uh, this is something that uh, a few of us had been advocating, Councillor Bradford, Councillor Cressy, myself, the Mayor, to actually um, make sure that we're targeting a homeless, chronic homeless population with these housing allowances so we can house them as soon as possible and measure this efficiency. So this is actually a partnership that, uh, and a close collaboration that we're going to be uh, working with the nonprofit sector, with the Alliance to Hand Homeless, and to ensure that these, uh, these um, housing allowances are actually put to good work uh, just as early as uh, August and uh, much needed housing allowances. I'll also bring to your attention uh, the uh, new approval framework for the Toronto Community Housing. As part of the restructuring that we're doing, we're uh, 
uh, creating this uh, revital the, these revitalizations in a much closer relationship with the city. So it's it's not only about building buildings, but it's about building communities, and that's why we want the involvement of several um, of these communities. And last, I'd like to. Uh, um, uh, thank he's not in the room councillor uh, Layton because I know he's been working with the uh, sector on the cask force and I'm happy to see that the city is updating his zoning bylaws uh, to uh, bring it to uh, the uh, the actual times that we have today and actually facilitate the work of many entrepreneurs in our city to create uh, a thriving brewery industry and since we're talking about zoning I would uh, like to emphasize uh, um, the motion that is also put forward by uh, the mayor and I on further uh, housing options uh, to talk about the missing middle I think is uh, time to have that conversation I'm looking forward to have the conversation starting here at council today and have the conversation uh, at uh, it with the city of Toronto about this uh, this important uh, addition to our housing uh, stock thank you thank you Deputy Mayor Minnewong, you have a motion to introduce the Striking Committee report? Uh, yes, thank you that the report for meeting two of the Striking Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to introduce the Etobicoke York Committee Council report? Yes, I do, and good morning, Madam Speaker, that the report for meeting seven of the Etobicoke York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, that the report for meeting seven of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Now, normally I wouldn't comment uh, on, on a Community Council report, but um, the lawyers for Toronto Lands Corporation attended our meeting regarding an application at 368, 386 Eglinton Avenue East. And they left with us a four page uh, letter, which I will distribute to councillors. And I strongly urge you uh, to read it. And they are coming out of the woodwork urging uh, city councillors to put holds on various property developments and other developments across the city, a less school <coughs> capacity in the area can handle the increase in population. Well, that's quite the ask. It's quite out of the blue, and it's quite unrealistic. But I'll let you, I'll let you read the uh, item uh, where a motion was actually moved at North York Community Council for staff to consider such, and I'll circulate this letter and maybe we'll hear from legal later. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerjanis, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good morning. That the report for meeting seven of the Scarborough Community Council list of the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Perch, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Thank you very much, Speaker. I move that the report from meeting seven of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. And I would like to extend my thanks to the clerks and AV staff for managing uh, us getting back into the triple digit agenda items of Toronto East York Community Council. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam, you have a motion to introduce the new business and business previously requested by city officials. Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. I would move that the new business and business previously re requested by the city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. And Madam Speaker, if I can also just take a moment for a point of personal privilege, I want to acknowledge the students as well as the instructor, uh, their instructor, Tony Dixon from the Academy of Learning, uh, which is a private career college, um, which was originally uh, located at uh, Bloor and Bay, and they have now moved a little bit closer to City Hall. They are now located at uh, Bay and Queen, uh, so that makes them effectively our neighbors. Many of these students are newcomers. They're looking to uh, to advance uh, career development and uh, and begin a uh, new life in Toronto in so many ways. So I just wanted to welcome them uh, to the chamber. Thank you very much, folks. I did not have the marks printed. <laughs> Those in favor of the motions, recorded vote.
The motion is to introduce uh, the reports and uh, new business. Carries unanimously, 24 in favor. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minawong, I understand you have a procedure motion at this time. How did you know that? Uh, that in accordance with section 27.7-10 uh, of council procedures, city council remove ST 3.1 headed 2020 schedule of meetings <clears throat> from the striking committee and bring the item forward to council for consideration. We debated this for uh, quite some time, the council agenda. We've uh, condensed it to four meetings a year. I'm, ki I'm no. kidding. No. We could, no. We, could have a, we could have a debate about that. Every quarter we'll have a meeting. It'll be a little longer. No, no, we have the regular council agenda for next year. Um, because of the, ti the time of the meeting, we need this motion to be put forward to add it to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number, and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. If you, are, if you have any, if you could put your name up, request to question staff. Mayor Tory. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I have two. Uh, the first is in respect of item EC 6.7, removal of a director from the Mount Pleasant Village Business Improvement Area. And uh, the nature of my interest is that uh, my wife's business is located within the Mount Pleasant Village Business Improvement Area. So out of an abundance of caution, I thought I should uh, declare an interest there. And the second one is in respect of item CC 9.8, minister's approval of official plan amendments 405, Young Eglinton and 406. Uh, and my interest there is arising out of the fact that my mother's home, a uh, piece of property in which I have an investment and my wife's business are all within the boundaries of the cited report. Thank you. I would now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Okay, members, I will now review the order paper. The mayor has designated item EX 7.1 headed implementing tenants first and new seniors housing corporation and proposed changes to Toronto Community Housing Corporation's governance. In item IE 6.A, headed Vision Zero, Road Safety Plan, as is key matters for this evening, for this meeting. Um, Councillor Councilor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On a point of order, I just missed your uh, call for petition. It happened so quickly. Um, I would like to uh, table this uh, uh, 842 uh, handwritten signatures, which is quite unusual for a petition. Um, from the community of St. James Town, uh, and I will take the opportunity to just read uh, very quickly the introduction, uh, that these 842 residents, uh, the undersigned residents of the City of Toronto, draw attention to Toronto City Council to the following, that whereas large-scale critical incidents at 650 Parliament, 200, 240, 260, and 280 Wellesley East have required multi-sectoral response efforts from the local community, service providers, Office of Emergency Management, Red Cross, and all levels of government. That North St. Jamestown residents have higher rates of hospitalization than those of other Toronto Central Lynn's neighborhoods, including mental health and ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Access to continuous primary care, preventative care, and alternative level of care are lower in North St. Jamestown than the Toronto Central Lynn's average. Children and youth have the highest low urgency emergency visit rates in Mid-East Toronto. North St. Jamestown is Toronto's most densely populated neighborhood with a significantly lower medium uh, household income than the City of Toronto, as well as the highest immigrant and recent immigrant populations facing systemic marginalization in public service and additional factors attached in appendix, uh, which I will not read. But the petitioners are calling upon Toronto City Council to designate Neighborhood number 74, also known as North St. Jamestown, a neighborhood improvement area under the Toronto Strong Neighborhood Strategy 2020. And this petition is in reference to a member motion that we'll be dealing with shortly uh, tomorrow, uh, 9.26. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. All those in favor of receiving the petitions, recorded vote.
The motion carries unanimously, 24 in favor. Thank you. Notices of motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow, only if the mayor's key matters are completed. I propose that City Council set a time for a closed session, if required, later in the meeting. The City Clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds, and I will recognize requests to make matters urgent at time specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by council, any change would need a two-thirds vote. Page three. <laughs> Councillor Fletcher. What are we holding? <laughs> I know. Thank you. Uh, EX 7.9, no, EX 10. Oh, I'm already holding it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. You Sorry. Page, page four. Councillor Bylaw. I'm still on page three, Madam Speaker. Uh, if uh, everybody's okay, I'm okay to release 7.2 just on a recorded vote. Okay, on page three. EX 7.2 is being released. All in favor? Oh, you want to hold it, Councilor? Yep. Okay, all right. Well, did you still want to hold it in your name or Councilor Wong Tam? Councilor Wong Tam can have it. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Perks, are you on page three or page four? Four? Okay, Councilor Perks, page four. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would like to hold EX 7.14 Capital Variance Report for the year ended December 31st, 2018. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, page four. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold EX 7.26. Page five. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to hold AU 3.6, Auditor General's 2019 Status Report on Outstanding Audit Recommendations for City Agencies and Corporations. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have two items held on the Audit uh, Committee agenda, number 12 and number 16. I can release both of them. Okay. Councillor Ainsley is releasing AU 3.12. On favor? Carried. AU 3.16, on favor, carried. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold uh, 3.15. Okay. Oh. Engineering and Construction Services, Phase 2 Construction Contract Change Management. Have I really never held anything? Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Carroll. Uh, I had the same item, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Page six. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I've held uh, eight, uh, C A eight seven. Um, I can release that. But I'd like to have a recorded vote on that item, please. Okay. On page six, C A. 8.7, Councillor Thompson is asking for recorded vote. Recorded vote. The item carries 24 to 1. <clears throat> On page 7. <laughs> Councillor Cole, page 7. 
Yes, I'd like to hold uh, Madam Chair EC 6.6 .6, appointments to Uptown Young Business Improvement Area Board of Management Ward 8 12 15. Okay. That's on page 7, EC 6.6. .6. Councillor Robinson. On page 7, uh, EC 6.11, amendments to purchase orders uh, for emergency hotel, motel accommodation, etc. Page 8. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold EC 6.16, the Downtown East 2023 Five Year Action Plan, as well as EC 6.18, implementing the Regent Park Social Development Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, I can release on uh, General Government Licensing Committee, GL 6.2, annual update on Ontario Municipal Employee Retirement System, OMERS, as it relates to the city's employee contributions. Okay, on um, favor? Oh, okay. So, Councillor Aisy, did you still want to hold it your, in your name? Nope. No? Okay. Councillor Peruzza would like to hold no, the hear. item down. Okay, just one sec. Okay, um, Councillor Peruzza, page eight. Page eight, um, GL six six seven, GL and GL six eight. So six, six two six seven six eight on that page, Speaker. So you want to hold on page eight, GL six point seven and GL eight point eight. Six point eight. Six. Um, the Toronto Civic Employees Pension Plan proposed merger with the Ontario Municipal. Uh, employees retirement system owners. Um, 6.8. 6.8, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's what I said. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were holding two items down. Uh, three. <laughs> Councillor Robinson. Um, on page 8, uh, EC 6.23, supporting three significant events. I just have some questions for staff. Councillor Karagiannis, are you on page 8? Oh, okay. Page 9. Councillor Karagiannis. Uh, Madam Chair, on page 9, GL 6.13. 2018 final report on property sales, acquisitions, expropriation, and leases. Okay. Which number, Jimmy? Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, I believe on, we're on page nine now, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, page, yes, nine, page nine, GL 6.19, Community Space Tenancy Lease Agreement and Municipal Capital Facility Designation for Toronto Community and Cultural Center at 1650 Finch Avenue East. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, page nine, GL 6.14, real estate acquisitions and expropriation of property interests near the Christie subway station for the easier access phase three project. Okay. Page 10. Page 10. Page 11. Councillor Cressy. Uh, yes, Speaker. Councillor Layton, who stepped out, asked that item PH 7.2, Task Force Zoning Bylaw Amendments, be held. I'm happy to have it held in my name and transferred to him when he's back, or if we can put it in his name here, whatever we can do. Okay. <laughs> Councillor. Bylaw. Um, Madam Speaker, 7.3, there's uh, a, an attachment and I'd like to table the report and uh, if uh, Councillor is okay, we can move, uh, we can vote on it or then, uh... yep, that's fine. Uh, so we'll table the report on this and vote at it at a later time. Okay. I'll hold it, I'll hold it. Yes, yep. yes. Um. Okay. <coughs> Page 12.
Okay, um, Councillor Wong Tam, are you on page 12? Okay, if we can maybe clear, uh, okay. Now, if you could put your name up because the names, okay, Councillor Wong Tam, page uh, 12. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. PH 7.9, Emergency Management and Vital Service Disruption Response in, in Apartment Buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to hold PH 7.6 on page 12, activating federal provincial funding to increase housing options for Toronto residents. Thank you. <clears throat> page 13. Page 14. Councillor Robinson. Uh, on page 14, NY 7.3, final report zoning bylaw amendment for Industrial Street. I have two others on the okay. same page. Okay. NY 7.5, final report rental housing demolition application uh, on Young Street. Okay. And Strathgowan, and then NY 7.6 request for directions report, um, Eglinton Avenue w East. Okay. And, okay. Can I? Um, okay. Uh, Councillor Billion, would you like to hold the seven because it's here without a recommendation and it's in your ward? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, my apologies, Madam Speaker. I need to hold something on page 13. It's EY 7.12, application to remove a private tree at 22 Boxwood Road. Page 15. Yes. Okay. On page 15, Councillor Pasternak, you'll hold it down. It's in your ward. It's here without a recommendation. Councillor Pasternak? Yeah. All right. So on page 15, do we have anything? Councillor Karagiannis. Uh, Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to uh, release SC 7.2 and SC 7.3, 3850 and 3900 Shepherd Avenue East, and 2350 and 2360 Kennedy Road official plan amendment final report. And the other one is 3453 Victoria Park and 5068, 50 to 68 more Camper Gate zoning bylaw amendment final report. Uh, can we have a recorded vote, please? Both. Uh-oh. So you want to release SC 7.2 and SC 7.3? Yes, correct? Madam Speaker, I'll okay. hold the 7. So we'll have a recorded vote on SC The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. On SC 7.3, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. 
The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 15, I'd like to hold NY 7.36, application to remove a city-owned tree in a private tree, 77 Citation Drive. Thank you. On page, page 16, Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I have three items. First of all, item TE 7.3, 300 Bloor Street West. Uh, Councillor Layton has stepped out of the room, and so I'm happy he asked me to hold that. Um, the, and then on page 16, items TE 7.8, 30 Bay Street and 60 Harbor Street, as well as item TE 7.9, alterations to a designated heritage property at 30 Bay Street. I have technical amendments from staff that were provided. If they're ready, I can move those both now. If they're ready? ready? Okay, we can <coughs> vote on it. So on page 16, T7.8, the technical amendment is on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. T7.9. Okay. The amendment is on the screen. All in favor, carried. Item is amended. All in favor, carried. Page 17. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, there are four items. I apologize, Councillors. Uh, TE 7.15, 55 to 61 Charles Street East, and I won't read the rest, but that's the first item on page 17 as well as TE 7.16, 56 Young Street, 21 Melinda Street, 18 to 30 uh, Wellington Street West, uh, 187 to 199 Bay Street and 25 King Street, also known as Commerce Court. So that's that item, as well as TE 7.17, which relates to, uh, to the item just above, almost co also Commerce Court, as well as TE 7.20, 230 Oak Street Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Amendment Application. There are no recommendations as of yet. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page 17, item TE 7.25, inclusion on the City of Toronto's Heritage Registrar, 40 to 44 and 71 to 75 Mitchell Avenue. It goes on. I'd like to hold that, please. Page 18. Councillor Perks, on uh, page uh, 17, T7.25 is related to an item that you've held down. So would you like, yeah. So would you like, to, this is on T7.24, so would you like to hold the item down? Um, 421 Ronsonville. Oh, sorry. So on, on the related item, um, there's a supplementary, and my intention was just to move the supplementary so we can let this go now. I don't need to hold it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Page, uh, Councillor Holliday, are you on page 17? Page 18, Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to request a recorded vote on TE 7.91 traffic control signals Young Street and Price Street slash Marlborough Avenue. Okay, recorded vote on page 18, Councillor Karagiannis, please.
Councilor Carrick Janice, your vote, please. Thank you. The item is adopted 22 to 2. Page 19. Councillor Fletcher, could I please hold uh, TE 7.129, Leslie Street and Lakeshore Boulevard, intersection safety, and uh, CC 9.1, report regarding the conduct of former Councillor Justin J. DiCiano. Thank you. Where would you hold the chair? What's it to you? Oh, What's right. it? Okay, are there any more on page 19? Page 20. <coughs> Councillor Robinson. Thank you. On page 20, CC 9.12, uh, 20, 2797, 2781 Young Street and Strathgowan. It's an amendment application, zoning bylaw amendment application. Thank you. Page 21. Page 20. Uh, CC 9.11995105 Broadview Avenue and 2 and 4 Mortimer Avenue. Zoning bylaw amendment application request for directions regarding local planning appeal tribunal hearing. Thank you. Page, page 21. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. On item CC 9.13, the Dundas West and Roncesvalles Avenue built form study, um, there's a supplementary CC 9.13A. Uh, I can move the recommendations in the supplementary and then release the main item. Okay, that's on page 21, CC 9.13. Councillor Perks is moving the supplementary. All in favor? Carried. Item as amended, on favor, carried. Page 22. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page 22, item CC 9.26, 504 Wellington Street West, all hold. That is the city solicitor's report is still due. Councillor Pasternak. Yes, I do apologize if we could go back one page to page 21, uh, CC 9.16, Murray Road Regeneration. I'd like to hold that item. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, page 22, Madam Speaker, CC 9.25, designation of the St. Lawrence Neighborhood Conservation District under Part 4. Sorry, part five of the Ontario Heritage Act. I'd like to hold that, please. Okay. Page 23. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Although the reports have not arrived in the council chamber, I'd like to hold CC 9.28 and CC 9.29. Okay, count, okay, that's it. Oh, Councillor Thompson? Oh, okay, can we, all right. <clears throat> I will now consider request to make items urgent and time specific, Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would propose that we make the Toronto Hydro item time specific as the first item of business on day two. That's been held by uh, Councillor Fletcher. And the rationale is that uh, we're in a heat wave with the threat of a thunderstorm. I would rather have the executives at Hydro uh, keeping the lights on than sitting in the chamber all day long. So. Okay. Councillor Fletcher suggesting that. Uh, 
Okay, Councillor Holliday. So you're moving that the Toronto Hydro. So, uh, Councillor Fletcher, in in uh, recognition of trying to work something out here, she said first thing after notice of motion. So I'll, I'm happy to propose that, and I have some additional times Thank that you. I would like to propose. Thank you. Okay, so the the Toronto Hydro item, following members' motions by Councillor Holliday. On favor? Carried. Uh, Madam Speaker, I have two others. I would like to time. Uh, the second would be the audit item uh, concerning the uh, wait lists for housing opportunities. Forgive me here, I'm just going to flip pages to get the number. Uh, given the complexity of that matter and the requirement for a number of different uh, departments, including the auditor, I would propose that be the first item of business tomorrow morning. So that may be heard and considered because I suspect there will be questions from councillors. Okay, on Councillor Holliday's motion. On favor, carry. And the third proposal I would have are the two items concerning trees, that they be A, held together, and B, that they be held as the second item of business following members' motions because um, I believe that there'll be a significant amount of debate on that item and I think no. the various departments that need no. to answer the questions on it should be in the room. No. And uh, I think we better set some time aside rather than 11 o'clock at night to have that debate. Okay, recorded vote. I, I believe we're going to come back on Thursday too. So Thursday we have a lot of time. Okay. Recorded vote on Councillor Holliday's motion. Councillor Cole, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 10 to 16. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. On uh, page 19, CC 9.2, the Ombudsman Toronto inquire report review of Toronto Transit Commission investigation of a February 18, 2018 incident involving a transit fare inspector. I would like to have that item be held after, I guess, the hydro uh, item that's being uh, timed after members' motion. Okay. Um, with, of course, with TTC staff present and um, uh, perhaps it would be helpful to have police as well because they're involved. Okay, on favor, carried. Councillor Kergianis. Madam Speaker, um, on page 11, IE 6.13 Go Expansion Program, Steeles Avenue, East Gray Separation, and Temporary Diversion Road. I'd like that to be the last item on the agenda. What? <laughs> <laughs> you are crazy. Last item on the agenda. Okay, on favor. Janice, can Madam, you mention the item uh, again? Madam, it is item 1, e, IE 6.13. Go Expansion Program, Steeles Avenue, East Separation and Temporary Diversion Road. The reason that I want it to be the last item, I need time to work with staff. We need to bring Metrolinks in here. Metrolinks, uh, we'll have we, it next week. How's that? Well, we, I can defer it for the next time, but I certainly don't want the staff, they don't want this. But there's a whole bunch of different... Uh, divisions that are involved and I need time over the next 24 hours in order to uh, make sure that the protocol that was set is followed, Metrolinx is deviating and they're starting to do their own things and it's really affecting my merchants. Yeah, hold on, Councillor Perks, point of order. The uh, provision that allows us to make items time specific is that there is some urgent aspect to them. I fail to see how asking for something to go at the end is necessary when it's urgent. So I'd ask you to rule that out of order. No, I Not think a question. I think that's up to me to answer the question. <laughs> so it, yeah, so your, your motion is not in order. Well, when it comes to you, when we get to it, we'll get to it. Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, page 11. Uh, cycling network plan, if we could time that uh, after the mayor's okay. key items. I'm sorry, Councillor Pasternak. 
Page. I didn't hear you. Page 11, uh, item 6.12, the cycling network plan, if we could time that after the mayor's key items. Okay. And um, page uh, 23, uh, item uh, CC 9.28 and CC 9.29, if we could do those two items together, uh, first thing tomorrow morning. I believe that we second already have something morning. scheduled to first thing tomorrow morning. We do it after second thing tomorrow morning. You better make sure the reports that are due are ready. Yeah. We'll hold this Only if we have the, okay, you know, like we're, we're trying to stick things in and, you know, really, I, we don't know how long these items are going to last. And when we have a time item and we don't get to it to two days later, I, I think you know? these two items will be five minutes. It's yeah. Just, just want to make sure I'm here. And uh, page uh, 21, uh, 9 point, uh, 9, CC 1.9.16 uh, Murray Road regeneration. If we could, if we could do that after um, the other two items, after CC 9.28 and CC 9.29. You just declared the other one. Your motion. Did the staff get that? Hmm? I, I, I'm going. I'm going back. All in favor? On. No, I'm, I'm going to deal with Councillor Pasternak first, and I'll get back to Councillor Kerjianis. Councillor pa um, Cal Pasternak's motion, all in favor? Carried. Councillor Kerjianis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if you cannot make it the last item on the agenda, can we have it the last item uh, after uh, uh, motions uh, yet tomorrow? I need, I need the 24 hours to talk to staff. This is on item uh, IE 6.13. So I believe that there's already an item that's been scheduled right after members' motions. Am I not correct? There's two. Can this be the third one, Madam Speaker? Yeah. It, it's hard for us to be scheduling all these items because we really don't know where we are because we're booking, we're booking items every hour. Um, so why don't we wait till later, Councillor? when we do the order paper again to see where we're at. As long as, okay, right. Okay, because we haven't started the agenda and it's five after 11. Okay. Okay. Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to uh, have the GL 6.31 vehicles for hire dealt after members' motions tomorrow afternoon. We already have two items. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll review the order paper again tomorrow. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Okay, we'll, we'll vote on um, EC 6.7 first and we'll ask the mayor if he could um, leave. Recorded vote. On EC 6.7. Councillor Bailau, please. And Councillor Karagiannis, please. And Councillor Robinson, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favor. Okay, Mayor Tory. Okay, so all those in favor of uh, adopting the remaining of the order paper, recorded vote. Councillor Bailau, please, when you're seated. Councillor Wong Tam, please.
The motion to adopt the order paper carries 25 to 1. Thank you. Members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you, and I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Members, City Council follows a routine for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the City Clerk staff. They will prepare the necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The Chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can seek leave to introduce at this meeting. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Mem motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. We will now go to the mayor's key item which is on page 3, EX 7.1, uh, tenants first. So do we have what do we have questions to staff? Councillor Robinson. Yeah, thank you very much. I just um, wondered what the cost implications of this um, endeavor is. Through the speaker, with respect to the um, implementation of the integrated service model in the seniors' buildings, uh, there is a potential net additional impact of five to six million. Uh, there are other mitigating uh, budget uh, items that will likely reduce that amount. Uh, and with respect to the movement of the development function. There's continuing due diligence on uh, uh, implications related to that recommendation. And so the wraparound services for seniors, uh, who will fund those uh, additional services? The, um, through the speaker, the uh, five to six million figure is related primarily to increased maintenance and cleaning uh, in the 83 uh, standalone seniors buildings. The increased costs associated with personal support and health related services will be an expense of the uh, Toronto Central LIN. Sorry? The Toronto Central Local Health Integration Network. Okay. Okay, and um, are staff being reallocated from one body to the and tr transition to the other body, or what is the staffing resource plan? Uh, there will be uh, discussions and negotiations with uh, labor partners with respect to um, where staff end up. It's anticipated that there will be minimal movement of staff currently providing services in the 83 buildings um, and we have had ongoing oh, I, and continuing sorry, just sorry if I could put everybody on hold if I can ask staff and members of council to please keep it down it's getting very noisy in the council chambers please okay go ahead Sorry. We have been working with labor partners for the past three years and will continue to do that in terms of uh, staffing implications on the seniors housing company. With respect to the development function, again, there is uh, required further due diligence to understand the staffing implications. And so um, are there new additional staff being hired in order to facilitate this? Uh, there will be new staff related to the implementation of the integrated service model uh, for the uh, 83 buildings. Is there a business plan in place for this uh, transition? 
Yes, we have been working through those details with uh, colleagues in TCHC. Uh, once we have council direction, um, we will come forward through the 2020 budget process uh, with the required funding uh, requests. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brillinger, I hate to do this to you on your last day. Um, so I want to make sure I understand. The, the proposal in front of us uh, suggests that there should be additional supports in terms of personal support, health, and cleaning and maintenance of the buildings. Is that? Through the speaker, the recommendation, uh, there are requests for or, or recommendations for increased service levels. More importantly, it's a change in how existing services are provided, yes. how staffing both within uh, the housing function, the community service function, and the health function are organized. That's, that's the, the focus of the integrated service model. So, so the idea here, if I understand it, is to provide better outcomes for the tenants in this than, than they currently have, and that involves uh, better integrating services and putting some additional resources in. Absolutely, and stabilizing the individuals, the uh, staff involved, so we're lowering the number of strangers in each building providing service, and uh, building consistency so it's the same staff interacting with the residents over a longer period of time, more consistency. And uh, if I recall correctly, this is uh, advice that we got from the mayor's task force that we needed to uh, look to ac accomplish these kinds of goals. Absolutely. There were elements of the task force recommendations that are uh, actioned through this recommendation. And my recollection is that uh, these kinds of recommendations were made not only for seniors but for all tenants of Toronto Community Housing. Through Tenants First reporting, uh, there has been a direction to focus uh, first on the seniors housing. We anticipate that there will I'm be... I'm simply asking if that, if that is the case. Sure. That the From the task force report, yes, that yes. is the case. When can we look forward to making the kinds of investments that you're describing here into uh, TCHC where there are other vulnerable populations? Through the speaker, additional investments have been made into TCHC over the last three years. There has been an increase in staffing. There will be learnings from the, the implementation of the integrated service model that will go back into the broader TCHC in terms of uh, how service provision may be modified. Um, the other focus of the work is to clarify the mandate of uh, the mixed uh, tenant housing uh, in TCHC and to look for ways to support that. The other uh, supplementary report here provides some of the learnings from the three pilots, two of which were focused on the broader TCHC housing. So when? Uh, there After your time, I know, but I, I mean, is there a plan for when? If there are specific uh, business cases and budget implications, those would come forward in the 2020 budget process. 2020? If, if they're at a stage where they're ready to make those business cases and requests. So 2020 maybe? Correct. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <coughs> Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, uh, a question of staff. Uh, Ms. Berlinger, in terms of uh, the um, the model here, is it really the uh, redoing of the Metro Housing Company model that used to exist and we got rid of it? Uh, through the speaker, um, no, I think it would be uh, significantly different because many of the buildings are in a different context, um, uh, experiencing different kinds of challenges and issues. Uh, than the MTHCL buildings would have uh, been experiencing 25 years ago. Uh, so it really is a change in how the three components, housing, health, and community support uh, services are provided in the 83 buildings. 
So would these former Metro Toronto housing company buildings, uh, which still exist, like I know on Bond Road there, there's one that Councillor Matlow's riding, uh, would that come under this umbrella of the new seniors uh, housing uh, model? Uh, most of the former MTHCL seniors buildings would. Some have changed in terms of having a mixed uh, tenant population, so those may not. Where there is a similarity is the recommendation with respect to the governance, uh, where there's a recommendation that Council uh, endorse moving to a separate board for the seniors' buildings. That is similar to the way MTHCL was organized. Yeah, and perhaps would it be helpful maybe to uh, consult with some of the former board members like uh, Councillor Michael Feldman and uh, Joanne Campbell to get their input on uh, this redoing of the model? Through the speaker, we did consult with um, uh, Joanne Campbell in, in early days uh, in the work. Um, and uh, it would be a pleasure to consult with Ms. Campbell again on this. And uh, hopefully Michael Feldman too, who's uh, be very interested in helping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, um, in my conversations with uh, Chris Fibbs during our briefings, I asked the question about whether or not uh, any of the lands as part of the TCUC revitalization process would be uh, or could be sold off uh, as part of that uh, part of that process, whether it be infill, what have you. Um, and she reassured me uh, that uh, that wouldn't be the case, that they would be retained in public hands. So I ask you, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, um, Mr. Brillinger, would you, would you have any uh, objection or concerns with a motion that just reassures uh, uh, tenants uh, and, the public, and the wider public uh, that uh, we will retain these in public hands, these assets. Through the speaker, to clarify, is the question with respect to the seniors housing? Yes. Uh, then through the speaker, there is no intention or consideration that land ownership or building ownership of those 83 buildings will change in any way. Good, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, um, I don't really see, and maybe you can point it out, any references to Toronto Public Health and what role they'll be playing in, in seniors in, in this new supportive model, housing model. Through the speaker, um, Tenants First staff have engaged with all divisions, including public health. Uh, through the work, um, we would anticipate that um, uh, different public health programs such as the Vulnerable Adult Support Program uh, and others would continue to be involved in the buildings uh, and involved in the service coordination. And uh, will, um, will the seniors portfolio align with the Toronto Senior Strategy? Very much so. In fact, that's why we've recommended that the oversight of the implementation of the integrated service model be a responsibility of the Senior Services and Long-Term Care Division, to in which will have carriage of the Senior Strategy as well, uh, to ensure that there is that integration and coordination. Now, in your on page five, in reference to the five to six million dollar uh, cost, it's referenced that it's uh, before uh, before recognized anticipated cost savings. What what kind of cost savings do you do you anticipate uh, from the strategy? Through the speaker, um, with the uh, integrated service model and increased in uh, building maintenance um, uh, and cleaning. We anticipate that there will be a reduction in purchase services uh, or requiring external contractors to, uh, to enter the building. Now, as you know, last term, uh, you were the lead on our social capital framework, uh, putting structure 
uh, to our relationships with third party uh, providers. I don't really see a strong emphasis of their role, uh, third party agencies and partners to provide various support services. Just wondering what the future will bring and bringing them in and making sure that the seniors are supported. Through the speaker, um, that is uh, the role of the local health integration network. They are the primary funder of community-based services delivered by uh, not-for-profit third-party agencies. They are very interested, as are we, in uh, simplifying the number of providers uh, entering each building and having better coordination and integration. Uh, this model meets their objectives as well, uh, and they have been engaging with the third-party providers in the change. And we can rely on the LIN to deliver comprehensive programming and supports? Through the speaker, there are many moving parts in the world at this point. Uh, we met with the acting CEO of the LIN uh, as recently as a week ago, and they are very committed, and we are still a go. Uh, for the implementation of the integrated service model. Now, finally, um, TCH staff work from Monday to Friday for the most part. Uh, when it comes to uh, a senior's portfolio, uh, staffing on the weekends is crucial. I'm just wondering whether there's been any discussion with our bargaining units to, uh, to have some staff, not on overtime, but have a three and a two, uh, a two and a three, uh, where you're working some of your, your 37 hours or 35 hours, whatever it is, on the weekend to make sure uh, we're there supporting seniors. Through the speaker, there will be opportunities to uh, have the conversation about staffing not only um, through uh, direct housing company staff, but also through partner staff, um, agency and health uh, staff. Uh, through the development and implementation of the model. So that is an ongoing conversation. So what's the likelihood of uh, us having staff, TCH staff supports on the weekends? In, in other words, I'm finding in the buildings that are in my area, the, we're overstaffed during the week and we don't have sufficient staff during the weekend. Certainly uh, extended hours will be a part of the phase one implementation in the 10 buildings. Uh, that will be determined on a building by building basis and in conversation with labor partners. Thank you. That was your last question. Speakers, uh, Mayor Tory. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to begin uh, the discussion, the speaking part of the discussion today, by uh, thanking the staff. Uh, and that the staff, in this sense, consists of both the staff of the city. Uh, who have been working on the tennis first thing consistently throughout and also the staff of TCHC. Um, I'll admit that I have, and I'm not alone I know in this because there are others that we've had discussions with, uh, I've been frustrated at the fact that uh, an exercise that was so well done I believe by uh, Senator Eagleton uh, as he then was uh, and result, it was the result of so much consultation uh, with the tenants principally because that's where he started off with probably the biggest single consultation that's ever been done with TCHC tenants. Um, and, and then a very considered report has taken uh, as long as it has to implement, especially the things that, uh, you know, are bolder changes. And I've come to understand that, you know, part of the reason a lot of times around here, not just on this item, that when you're making these bold changes, there are incredible complexities. So if you look, for example, at the, what's involved, and we're not there yet, but what's involved in the transfer of the 83 buildings to a separate seniors entity, there are, as you might imagine, and some of them are alluded to in the report, a myriad of legal and, and financing and other kinds of questions that come up that are uh, things that have no easy answer to them and that often involve, um, you know, making sure we have counsel and then work out a way to do things uh, under f different, uh, you know, financings that have been put on these buildings and so forth. I guess um, uh, coming to the good news, um, we're moving forward and, and, and it's, uh, uh, it's because I think a number of us interested in this area and I think probably concurred in by all the members of council, I hope so, um, say it's time for us to take these actions and just get them done. And that consists of all the things that are in this report, which don't represent the entire implementation of Tenants First, but represent some very important steps forward with respect to two things, I think, that are most fundamental. The, the most fundamental of all 
is that the upshot of this report was, and something I concurred in hugely, and I think all members do, which is that we want to make sure TCHC is put in a position structurally uh, and in other ways that they can focus on their core task, which is really, I think, at the essence of the uh, Eagleton report, which is to be the best landlord they can possibly be. And, and inevitably, because of the nature of, of the population that reside in, uh, in, in uh, Toronto Community Housing and some of their special needs and the fact that it's a public uh, organization and has a spotlight shone upon it and so forth and so on, uh, and various other things we're doing that are very much in the public interest, like the revitalizations, the, the uh, opportunity to become distracted from just being a good, solid landlord, you know, is, is, are, are many. And, and so I think by taking some of the steps we're taking, by having the seniors put into a separate entity where we can really focus on being, yes, the best landlord we can be, but with a, uh, a slightly different mandate there, and that's not to diminish in any way any other tenants, but it's to say seniors have special needs that need to be addressed, and that's where this partnership that I made reference to this morning uh, needs to be formed, especially with, but not limited to, the provincial government and others in the nonprofit sector. And then, with respect to the balance of the tenants, by moving the development function, and I know that Councillor Cressy may have a word or two to say about this, but by moving the development function to create TO, uh, you're going to continue with the incredibly important work that we have with respect to revitalization, but you're going to have that happen in a way that does not involve distraction, uh, again, from the principal focus of TCHC, which is to be a good landlord, to keep the buildings in state a state of good repair, to make sure that working with all of us who are providing the money, that we never again let them deteriorate to the extent they had deteriorated, to make sure that we bring about improvements in the areas that the tenants raised with us. You'll recall the number one area they raised with us in the Eagleton report wasn't even the state of repair, it was security, security as in safety. And, and we have a job to do and there is work being done on that now by the board of TCHC. And so, um, I just think this is a very important moment in that there are some changes being taken here that people will agree or disagree with. I think most people agree with them. Um, they're going to be done carefully, but make no mistake from my perspective, they're going to be done with a degree of dispatch because uh, we have taken the time to look at the issues, to look at the legal implications, the financial implications, to discuss the policy implications, to consult the tenants, and now it's time to move. Um, and, and as I said this morning in talking to the media and in my brief remarks uh, introducing the executive committee report, I think there is unanimous agreement uh, through this uh, chamber that the one thing that cannot prevail is the status quo. Uh, the status quo has got us to a situation where the buildings were in bad repair, we were not the best landlord we could be, uh, the safety and security of the tenants was not what it should be, uh, the, the supports were not provided because we got into a situation where in fact seniors sometimes were the least supported in some of these buildings just because of the nature of how things have evolved over time. So I commend this report and its recommendations to the members of council. I think it's a result of a lot of our hard work and again my thanks to the, to the staff uh, of both TCHC and the city, the board of TCHC and the residents of TCHC who, uh, who started off by giving us the input that lies at the very heart of this report and its recommendations. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. To speak, Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, let me begin by placing an amendment, uh, which is for the recommendation as it relates to the development functions to consider the range of activities and divisions that coordinate with development but are not under the development team within TCHC and to consult those, and I've identified specific parties to consult who have been engaged in the range of development related activities as part of revitalizations. Uh, let me begin first of all by echoing the comments of the mayor and thanking our city staff for all their hard work as well as the TCHC staff for all of their hard work because I know this has been a collaboration. Um, if I think about what the overall objectives are as it relates to considering future steps for Toronto community housing and the people who live there, I think first and foremost as the mayor has mentioned it is to maintain the buildings we have, and to be a strong landlord. That is first and foremost our main objective. But I want to be very careful not to think that is, not to think that that is our only objective. Because the other component is to ensure that we are actually building strong and livable communities. That's more than being a landlord. That is ensuring that residents have a say over their homes. That's aligning the services that the city delivers, that the province delivers, and that TCHC delivers together effectively. And so, a strong landlord first, but more than that. As it relates to, seeving, uh, to seniors, excuse me, uh, I strongly believe 
that first of all, housing, that stock should be publicly owned, as it is today and will be tomorrow. But I think the lesson since amalgamation is that housing, publicly owned housing, is best delivered when it is specialized. I, I, the history lesson here is that we are going right back to 1996. In 1996, prior to amalgamation, we had the Metro Toronto Housing Corporation, seniors, the Metro Toronto Housing Authority, non-seniors, and city home, scattered homes. And what are we doing today? The seniors unit, formerly known as MTHC, Toronto Community Housing, formerly known as MTHA, and the scattered homes to be operated by nonprofits formerly known as City Home. And so far too often, and I, I find this in my five years here, we have a pattern in government where we centralize all functions or decentralize functions. We're sort of doing one or the other. And so my concern here, and I'm fully supportive of that move with seniors. It is critical, it is important, not just because it is to establish an independent unit, but it's so that we can align the delivery of long-term care services that we provide better for the seniors in the new seniors unit. That's what I mean about being more than a landlord. But as it relates to the discussion we're having of the development arm and the reason for my amendment, it's based on my experience in Alexandra Park, a revitalization that is 12 years in and will be another 12 to 13 years until it's done. And it's because revitalizations, whether it's in Alexandra Park, Regent Park, Lawrence Heights, 250 Davenport, it goes on and on, they're about development in buildings but if that's all they're about, they fail. They're fundamentally about people. It's about the people who live there, and yes, ensuring that they have new housing, but also that they have jobs and mentorship opportunities and the social infrastructure to make the neighborhoods livable. And they're also community-led. And so development within Toronto Community Housing, it's actually broad and integrated. There may be a development team that does land deal planning and construction, but then you have tenant and community services that deals with the social development plans and the scholarships directly integrated with the development team. You have the relocation team that assists with moving and plans moving directly in coordination with the development team. You have the asset management team that deals with ongoing capital repairs. And in Alexandra Park, that's a 25-year revitalization. We don't just stop doing repairs. And so this is far more complicated than simply saying TCHC should focus on being a landlord and not a developer because if you're going to build a revitalized community for people, it all fits together. And so we have to be careful in an attempt to fix one thing that we don't break another. And so I will close by saying that I'm thrilled that we're continuing to move forward with the tenants first approach. It has seen real successes to date, and I think with the establishment of a seniors unit, we will see more successes in the future, success being defined by quality of living for our tenants. And with my amendment, I hope to ensure that as we consider the next steps with the development arm, that we do it in a holistic fashion so that we don't end up, just like we did with getting rid of MTHC, MTHA, and City Home to establish one, doing the same thing now with development only 20 years from now to try and correct it after the fact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Matt Lowe to speak. Madam uh, Speaker, I have a motion. Um, and I'll be begin by uh, contributing to the comments made by Mayor Tory and Councillor Cressy with respect to the importance of uh, having a focus on seniors' needs, uh, but doing it in a way that doesn't just focus on the fact that we need to be a terrific landlord but also contribute to helping people live at home longer in their neighborhoods, well served holistically and comprehensively by services that should meet the needs both of the residents within our buildings, but also for seniors who may live in the neighborhood in privately owned buildings, but need access to those services. And I'm hoping that as we move forward, that where we find uh, uh, ways to accommodate services within our buildings, they will be accessible in a safe and secure way to the residents in those buildings, to seniors no matter where they live in the neighborhood. That helps people live at home longer, perhaps till their end days, and, uh, and mitigates uh, the potential of them having to uh, enter long-term care facilities or other uh, types of facilities that uh, uh, most people, you know, they, they may have to go to but would prefer to live in the neighborhoods that uh, they may have raised a family and or lived in for many years and, and call home. Uh, they know the local people, they know the local merchants, that is their home. Um, 
And in the next 20 years, one in five of us are going to be over 65. I mean, it's, it's really important that as our demographic is changing and aging rapidly, that we do things now to more proactively get ready for that. The government's really good at reacting. You know, every time that there's a crisis, every time that there's an issue, uh, some politician will uh, make a, you know, do a press conference saying we're going to do something about it. But rarely does government uh, think in the long term. And this is one of these steps where we are, we are taking necessary measures to focus on the reality of our changing demographics within our city as is reflecting, reflective of society at large, certainly throughout North America and Europe. Um, moreover, um, there, I've been hearing for years that there's a need within our seniors' housing. Uh, to better reflect their priorities in a more comp comprehensive way and have a better governance structure. And while this will be retained by TCH, City Hall will now be answerable. We are creating a division that will have oversight over the many different services and priorities that we set for seniors no matter where they live in the city. There will be better governance and better accountability and that's why this is an incredibly important step moving forward. The reason I moved this motion is because I had a conversation with Chris Phibbs, as I mentioned earlier, about the importance of retaining these lands in public hands. You know, once you sell it, it's gone forever. And typically, if you need it in the future, it's going to be much more expensive to ever acquire, as we've learned time and time again. So what this motion does is it reaffirms what I've already heard from staff, but it actually puts into policy, which is just not written into, this, uh, into these recommendations that as we move forward with revitalizing these lands and finding opportunities to build new, pro new buildings, for example, on infill sites uh, or add-ons to the existing buildings, uh, that uh, we, retain those, uh, we retain those assets. Certainly, we might have development partners that we work with. Uh, we might have long-term leases, what have you. Uh, but once you let it go, it's gone forever. And as I said in my uh, initial comments, the need is just going to grow. It's not going to get. It's not going to get any better. It's going to keep growing, and we need to have those lands available in the long run because those needs are going to continue coming in. So I just want to thank Mayor Tory. I want to thank uh, the task force, uh, Senator Eggleton, and our staff who have done, uh, I think, a terrific job in moving this forward. Uh, the Toronto Seniors Forum and everyone who's been advising this uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Fletcher. Clarification of the motion, three yeah. minutes. Unfortunately, I don't have the motion, Speaker. It's on the screen. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so it. it's my understanding that we're not really into selling the land, including in housing now, that we have a long-term lease position. My, Is that not right? Um, my understanding, based on what has been spoken by staff, is that there is no plan to sell off uh, the lands. That being said, I don't see those words in the recommendations before us, and I want to reaffirm Council's position that we retain those properties rather than sell them off. You're aware that with housing now, we're not selling any land. Yeah. Would you not assume that would apply to TCHC? I, I'm, I, 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 I've, I've I've learned that, that making assumptions is not always uh, a safe bet. Oh, and I, actually, uh, I'm reminded that there, are, there I think there, there, are, there is a portion of those lands that I could see. be sold off through housing yes. now. Again, I just don't want to make any assumptions. I think if it is council's position, and we'll find out after the vote on this, okay. that we should retain those lands, then I think we need to uh, make it clear. Thank you. And have you spoken to TCHC about this uh, motion? Uh, no, I've spoken with... Uh, with our, with, uh, with, as I said, Chris Bibbs uh, during our briefing. Uh, so you haven't had a chance to speak there. directly to the CEO? Uh, not so much a chance, but I, I, I think actually what's more of import is what, uh, what our position is. Uh, the, uh, much of this, uh, I, I say candidly, uh, uh, TCH may have not been the biggest fan of moving forward in this direction in the first place, this whole initiative. And, uh, and more recently, they've come on board and they've been very productive players. But uh, it, it, I think, it, I think the, the direction needs to come from the top, and, and that is us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. Um, 
I, I am supportive of what's here, and I do want to congratulate uh, city staff, the mayor's office, Mr. Brillinger, and everyone else who's worked on it. I'm also uh, keen to see and excited to see that we are recognizing that uh, simply having a building and having seniors in it isn't enough, but we need to work to make sure that uh, the suite of services available to the individuals and additional services to maintain the building have you know, uh, keep it in a good state of repair and clean are important things to do. That's very important. I, I want to recall, though, that uh, this council, not in this term, not in last term, but in the previous one, actually stripped out a lot of those services. And I, I want to use that as a point of departure to think a little bit about what we're doing here and what we're not doing. If you recall, at the beginning of Mayor Ford's term, within the first few months, <clears throat> the leadership, the board, the management, and many, many of the frontline workers within Toronto Community Housing who were providing exactly the services we're putting in now were stripped out. It was done deliberately and with forethought. And I want to note that it, you know, and as many people have said, Governments can break things quickly, but putting them back together takes a long, long time. Here we are, quite a few years later, trying to repair that damage that was done. On a less positive note, though, I want to take a moment and think a little bit about why it is that we're able to restore the services that support seniors today, and we are not able to restore the services that support racialized people, that we are not able to restore the services that support women in poverty, that we are not able to support, restore the services that support people with mental health issues, that we are not able to restore the services for people with addiction issues. I don't think it's hard to figure out what the difference is. Seniors are mom and apple pie. It's very easy for all of us to think, yes, seniors deserve better. It's not as easy to think that stigmatized and socially marginalized groups should get those same services. And I am profoundly disappointed in the current administration that we solve the problem for mom and apple pie, but we don't have the same commitment and courage and urgency around people where there is more stigma attached. It's frankly infuriating. We have a public health crisis right now. There are no additional supports to the tenants in TCHC who are victims of that public health crisis. We have a violence issue in the City of Toronto. We have had available to us the Roots of Violence report for a decade and a half, and we're not doing the things to implement that work here at this Council meeting. It is, it is a huge failure on the part of this council that we can solve the social supports problem for people who are not stigmatized and have, after what, seven years, eight years, not solved the problem for people that are a little bit more challenging socially to provide social supports to. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to step up. You heard from Mr. Brillinger when I was asking questions about this that we may have business cases in the 2020 budget. I think we all got to go home tonight, take a good look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we going to insist that the social supports necessary for other marginalized groups in our society will be here in 2020? I'll be watching. I hope all of you are too. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. I guess I really, uh, my comments really just reinforce what Councillor Perks has said and to an extent uh, what uh, Councillor Matlow has said uh, because it, it goes back to uh, uh, a lot of his work on the senior strategy. But I just, I wanted to compliment uh, uh, housing, both staff and, and the, the committee members in for once, we're, we're really getting ahead of a crisis and uh, in a way that, that really people should view this through that, that, uh, that lens that we often hear 
of the one taxpayer. There is only one taxpayer when it comes to how we are going to deal with seniors uh, who have uh, uh, lesser resources. More and more and more uh, people are retiring without pension, other than, uh, than their government uh, uh, CPP. Uh, the federal government is trying to catch up with the crisis by increasing gains, the, the, the guaranteed income supplement, because they, they realize that they now have a growing population that will have no other pension. CPP was not designed to be your only pension, and yet because we have taken a different idea as to what employment standards should be, we now have a tremendous uh, number of people retiring now, and certainly in the future will retire with no other pension but their, their uh, CPP, and they're now ineligible for OAS, uh, people being uh, uh, um, uh, entered into retirement world who are a little bit younger than me. I'm the last year of people who will get that full OAS. And so we have to now figure out how do we house people who without housing, by the tender age of 70, while still fully lucid, while still fully mobile, would be so desperate as to be applying to be in long-term care basic income beds for housing. That's what happens. If we, don't, uh, if we don't begin to work to make sure that we're maximizing what we can in our senior units, we will see fully functional people begging for basic income beds in long-term care homes. And we have a crisis there as well. We have capacity issues there. But there will be no other option for people who otherwise would, uh, their next step would be a shelter. And so we actually are getting ahead of a curve for once in our lives. And here we are doing it at the municipal level. We can only hope that as the numbers grow and grow and grow, that other orders of government are going to realize they have to help us with this. That they can't just talk about long-term care every uh, four years when it's election time. Talk about pretty plans, throw big numbers out there, and then do nothing about it, build nothing, and not even fund us. Because if they want it built, we, we'd be happy to do it for them under our long-term care plan. But the funds haven't come to create those campuses of care that we envisioned and promised to build if they wanted to partner with us. And it's still not coming. In fact, it's getting more and more quiet over there in terms of how we're going to expand that. And so being able to address housing needs in senior units, like Glebe Manor and Seneca Towers in, in my neighborhood, we need more and more of those, but we need the supports around them. And for those people who have been lucky enough to get in them, we need the supports beyond just being a landlord that can say, this is someone who should now move from here into long-term care. We need to have somebody on site that is able to give the supports and do the assessing that needs to be done. Because we're going to see two very taxed systems. And while one is primarily being supported by, by an income tax pot, Increasingly, here we are with the property tax pot, trying to fill the gap. But at the very least, we are introducing measures in the tenant's first policy now that allow us to get through those bridge years to when other orders of government realize the crisis in seniors' care and seniors' housing. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to staff for, for having this forethought. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I want to speak in support of this, uh, I think, very transformative initiative uh, because uh, as we talk about our seniors, we're, we're talking really about a very fragile and vulnerable population. It really is a population at risk because... Uh, uh, Councillor, do you have a motion? Yes, I do. I you you have to ready. present it first before you speak. Okay, can I see it up on the screen, please? Okay. I just want to move a motion uh, that essentially uh, ensures that before we go forward with this, that, that we consult with uh, some former uh, experts in this area uh, that uh, used to uh, provide seniors housing for the City of Toronto. And this organization, and somebody I think Councillor Cressy mentioned, was the Metropolitan Toronto Housing Corporation. Uh, and they're still uh, 
a couple of them that are very active, very interested. I mentioned Joanne Campbell and uh, Michael Feldman. They, they would have great uh, insights into this, and I just hope you do a formal consultation with them uh, because this model worked very well in this time, and now we're going back to it with reinforced supports, which is great. So I, and I just think it's important to understand uh, that uh, we need to uh, focus uh, more attention on our vulnerable seniors. This, I think, initiative will allow us to do that. Uh, and it will always allow us to get rid of some of the confusion that exists in the delivery of supportive services. If you go into a uh, TCHC building, like uh, I frequent, uh, for instance, 855 Roselaw on a regular basis, there are many service providers in there. And the service providers that go in there for supportive housing, they don't talk to each other. And the seniors are really confused into saying, well, who is supposed to be helping me today? And who's helping someone next door is not giving me service. And so I think there's going to be an attempt to try and make this more seamless yeah, yeah. and with more of a, a hub approach. But I think that's much needed. I just want to, one personal experience I, I was brought to mind in talking to Councillor Peruzza was uh, a number of years ago, uh, I found uh, there was a real serious, uh, frightening problem seniors were facing in the city. And I know when I first raised it, people started to joke about it and make fun of it, but it was the bed bug problem. It was one of the most horrible things I've ever seen happen in the city of Toronto, where seniors especially were living in fear that they couldn't go to sleep at night uh, they couldn't sit in chairs because they were being bitten by bed bugs on a regular basis. This went on. They would clean their apartment. Uh, they would have uh, people come in and the TCAC people come in and do all kinds of uh, pest control. But the bed bugs would keep coming back. I remember this one senior. She was, I think, 85 years old. She was in an utter panic. She had bought new mattresses new furniture, and the bed bugs still kept coming back to her unit. And she told us, told the office at that time, that she was sleeping in the bathtub. That's the only place she could sleep to feel that she wasn't going to be bitten, was in the bathtub. And as a result of those kinds of interventions, I raised the issue at the province. We even had a bed bug summit where we brought in all the providers, and we eventually got the uh, Provincial Minister of Health to provide uh, $5 million to look at ways of dealing with this bed bug epidemic that was not only happening in Toronto, it was happening, we found out in Windsor, in Hamilton, in Ottawa. So they finally put some uh, provincial resources in dealing with this health problem, public health problem, which was bed bugs. Now, I, I'm sure there still are many issues with bed bugs, but it's a, an example of some of the unique things that seniors face in our housing, not only in our housing, but also in private housing, in hotels. So this might be a way of trying to coordinate, educate, and prevent some of these hazardous things that happen to our very fragile seniors. And that's why I'm fully support of this new direction that uh, we are going into in providing housing for our seniors. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Yes, uh, Speaker. I, I want to thank uh, city staff, our deputy city manager, SDFA staff, Mr. Brillinger, on his exit. This is his um, swan song, if we could call it that. Uh, such a transformational report and as well all of the staff at Toronto Community Housing and I very much want to thank our mayor and uh, our chair of the committee Councillor Bailao because this is a transformation that we're engaged in we've been on this path for quite a long time and actually it started under our former city manager Joe Panichetti our current city manager is seized with this and it is actually very exciting. I want to thank you, Councillor Cressy, for the history lesson today. Because sometimes we go back to amalgamation, 
But this time we went back to explain about the, the three corporations and how they were put together in a, with goodwill, thoughtfulness back in 2002 and established that. And some 16, 17 years later, we might, we're finding, I believe, that we have perhaps created something that's not as manageable as we would like. And in particular, the seniors unit, which Councillor Cressy referred to, that was under Metro, and number of people I've spoken to this week, they talk about that seniors unit and how focused it was on seniors and services. So that unit back then would be different than the one that we'd put together now because we're embedding in the new one all kinds of other things to deal with vulnerable seniors in a very thoughtful way that wasn't there under the old seniors portfolio as far as I know. And it is very important to do that. We're looking at the actual planning and development side, moving to create TO. This started with the tenants first, the mayor's task force that he had to look at how to transform this corporation, which is very, very big. And it might be too big to really meet the needs of all of the particular individuals in groups that we find living there, such as seniors, such as the most vulnerable. We've dealt with the single family homes, looking at providers that use that as their method, their method of delivering housing, which is not the method in the majority of homes at Toronto Community Housing. And I think this will allow us to go back to core mandates for each one, core mandates for seniors, core mandates for families, and that's a very important thing, and a core mandate for development, which is not distracting, but uh, will be managed from a development side, not necessarily through the board. I want to just take up what Councillor Cole had said, because Councillor Cole, I did visit Rose Lawn when Councillor Moscow was the, was the councillor. He asked me to go for the same reason. There were seniors sleeping in their lazy boy chairs. They wouldn't go to bed. They were terrified of bed bugs. There were people that were dragging furniture in. Streets to Homes was in the building. And this was a stable seniors building at that time. I'm not sure it's ever recovered. And you can tell me that later. But it was very sad to see. And also on the board when Al Gosling died in the hallway at Toronto Community Housing, and that was an attempt by the corporation to remove, um, to say that seniors didn't need as much assistance, so we would have the staff, the caretaking staff, look after all the paperwork. Well, that didn't work out too well because we had a vulnerable senior die in the hallway. We had Justice Lesage do a report, and out of that we have a commissioner of housing equity who helps seniors who might not be as lucid, get their paperwork in, not be evicted for arrears. Such an important transformation there that I know will carry over to the new unit. I also know from my own experience that when in buildings, there are many social workers in buildings, but they have nowhere to take their concerns and have a plan for those vulnerable tenants. I'm convinced that with the seniors unit, that all of that will come together in a different way than it currently is or able to come together at the current configuration of Toronto Community Housing. So this is not an easy thing to do and it's not easy for everyone involved. And I just want to thank everybody again for their thoughtfulness and their patience and their vision. Thank you. Councillor Baila. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by uh, thanking staff uh, at TCHC, staff at uh, SSHA, staff at the Housing Secretary. I think there's a number of city staff that have all worked uh, at some point in time on this uh, revitalization. And I think we are uh, at a milestone uh, um, in, in that big uh, revitalization of the entire TCHC. And I think when we reach this, these, uh, these uh, 
points in time, I think it's good to go back and to understand why did we start this in the first place. I always go back to our principles and see how are we responding to that. So one of the big principles was definitely we wanted to create better conditions uh, of living for the 110,000 residents that are part of Toronto Community Housing, almost the population of Prince Edward Island. And as almost a population of Prince Edward Island, tenants have different needs and are very different. And I think that we embarked on a discovery of knowing our tenants. And whoever worked in the private sector, there's always that expression, know your customer. I think we embarked on know your tenant. And we clearly identified that people have uh, different needs that we need to respond as a service manager, as a city, as a landlord. We need to find ways and partnerships to serve better our tenants. And that's what we started doing. We started to say, you know what? We need a service model for our seniors. That's what it's in front of us here. We need a service model to our uh, um, scattered homes. We have uh, uh, service models and we need certain partnerships uh, for our rooming houses. We're going to have you know, a big uh, nonprofit provider actually offering the services, the supportive housing that we need through the 22 rooming houses that we have. We, we, we have more to do, but one step uh, that we took is understanding that it's not 110,000 people that live the same way with the same needs, and we're drilling down on those needs because we feel like it is our responsibility to understand better uh, the needs of, of this population. We also understood that uh, in order to do that, we have to have a sustainable corporation. And we had a corporation that was not sustainable operational and could not even respond to the capital needs. We have done significant increases on the operating budget of TCHC. We are you know, continuing to do major investments and uh, revitalizations on, on, this, on the capital project. But one of the things that we did is we finally, we finally said, this is our problem. For, for many, many years, the city of Toronto had TCHC as this corporation over there that they were kind of their own. And these last, in these last few years, we said, Pro provincial and federal government, you have responsibility <coughs> over this issue. We're not saying you don't, but we are going to be part of the solution as well. And that's why it is important when you have the relationship unit that is going to be created in here, where you are going to be having a closer relationship with Toronto Community Housing because it is about building communities. It, has about, it is about building uh, uh, lives of, of, of our tenants and responding to the needs of our, of our communities that are well integrated into our city. And for that, we need to have a closer relationship to, to, uh, to Toronto Community Housing, and that's what we're doing as well. In terms of partnerships, I talked about some of the partnerships here, but I think that we have the opportunity to do a lot more partnerships. And I think that um, uh, Councillor Cressy uh, expressed some of his concerns with the development, but I think what we need to explore in here, and I think that his concerns are very valid and we need to take in consideration and do this carefully, but what we have in here is we have TCHC that is one of our housing providers and we have now the Housing Now program, we have other housing providers that could have the assistance of a very strong development arm as part of the City of Toronto. So for me, is actually how do we have a role as a city in assisting TCHC in developing, in assisting other nonprofits in developing, and in assisting the City of Toronto in developing. And we actually have that arm that is going to be uh, uh, creating more housing, not only with TCHC, with, which is one of our 200 housing providers, but actually as a city, leverage the incredible <laughs> talent that we have within TCHC and translate there into uh, other uh, housing providers. So I think uh, this is, like I said, uh, an important uh, um, period in this, in this revitalization, this transition. I'm hoping that we can have uh, uh, um, council support. Um, I know that has been taking time. Uh, we all want to put uh, uh, you know, foot to the pedal and get going, but it is important that we also do it carefully and that we, ke we keep in mind that it is 110,000 residents that we're talking about. It is about the largest landlord, and, um, and we need to move faster and, and, and be lean about these things, thank, uh, but thank we you. also have to be careful. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion, and I ask the clerk to put that on the screen. And that is to direct the Deputy City Manager and Community uh, Social Services to work with TCHC to establish a Senior Tenant Advisory Committee, uh, not necessarily a group, but a committee, 
the Senior Tenants Accessibility Advisory Committee and other relevant bodies to ensure that senior tenants can directly access and inform influence services and programs uh, to be provided by this new Seniors Housing Corporation. Um, I do, Madam Speaker, want to echo um, the support of uh, my councillor colleagues who have expressed um, enthusiasm uh, for the report. I think this is a, a step in the right direction. Um, Interestingly enough, it sounds like it's a step backward to go forward. What is old is now new again. It could be one of those back to the, uh, the future movements. Um, but I also want to just uh, acknowledge that although the report speaks to the fact that there will be uh, some type of advisory group, uh, what we don't know uh, right now is what does this group look like and, and how will it be com uh, comprised, how often will it be meeting, um, but I do know that uh, language does matter and calling it something a committee as opposed to a group uh, will give it more formal structure and hopefully more formal reporting to be, um, uh, to be uh, determined in the near future. Um, seniors are oftentimes, um, uh, we, we, we look at them in two ways and we're all going to be there at some point in time. Uh, some of us are getting there faster than others, uh, but we look at them as number one, as these sort of mystical sage creatures uh, full of wisdom, and on the other hand, they're extremely vulnerable. And then there's the, 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 com com the, uh, the population in between, uh, still mobile, still able to move around, uh, able to independently care for themselves. Um, and we need to take a look at what is the senior? Uh, that we are trying to um, provide this, uh, uh, to rebuild and re reformat this housing corporation for, and, and who is the senior profile that we are taking care of. And if we are talking about the most vulnerable, let's just focus on that for a moment, because if we can take care of the most vulnerable senior, there's a very good chance that all the other seniors in the continuum and spectrum of seniorhood that we are speaking of, they will also be taken care of. My concern about the new senior housing corporation, and I think that we should approach this with some caution. My concern is that the, the spectrum of needs for seniors um, is so wide and broad that if we don't enhance services and resources to help some of these seniors, especially those who are living with mental health, uh, dementia, or perhaps uh, mobility challenges, we are going to ultimately fail them in a new corporation with a new administrative and governance structure. And that also means that seniors have very specific accessibility needs. Um, and that has to, that requires a very different uh, sensibility and approach to how we design the programs and services for them. How those buildings and those uh, units are retrofitted specifically for physical use and, um, and access for seniors. Uh, we also need to take a look at poverty uh, within the senior population that's living in TCHC because let's, uh, let's not pretend that that doesn't exist, but we also need to name it. Uh, seniors are extremely vulnerable living in TCHC buildings, largely because they are on fixed incomes, living well, 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 well below the poverty line. And access to food, food security uh, is a major challenge. Nutrition is a major challenge for them. And then, of course, uh, we also need to take a look at abuse that seniors are subjected to in civil society whether it's about being ignored in meetings or perhaps not heard because they're starting to articulate themselves in different matter, um, uh, matters, communication uh, differences are starting to emerge as we, as we age. Um, and, uh, and all of that has to be taken in consideration. So therefore, if the new corporation is designing and building and implementing and eventually operationalizing programs for seniors, if they don't do it with the senior involvement and inf information at the core, we're probably going to miss the mark. Uh, that's why I think that this work uh, identifying the report is important, but I just want to make sure that we elevate it to make sure that we do not lose track of it and that the seniors have some direct influence over how their housing and the supports that they need in TCHC and the new form of the new Senior Housing Corporation uh, will be uh, uh, mandated and how that will be constructed will be most meaningful and, and, and um, delivered to them in the way that actually makes the most sense because they were directly informed uh, with how it was designed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I just wanted to, uh, to um, add a couple of things to, to this conversation as well. Um, Councillor Kolle is correct. We had a, a seniors housing uh, before that was, uh, that was seniors housing. It was uh, dedicated for seniors. And I remember 
going through that housing. And there generally was a, a friendly atmosphere. And yes, while seniors were poor, yes, while many of them felt isolated, yes, while many of them were lonely, they weren't afraid. What we have done since the merger of, of, uh, of seniors' housing with all of the other housing, for better or for worse, we've created a very, very difficult uh, situation uh, for this, uh, for this uh, particular group. You go into seniors' buildings now, and you knock on their doors. They're afraid to open their doors. They're afraid to talk to you. They're, they're isolated, they're lonely, but more importantly, they're afraid. Because the halls are hostile. The meeting rooms that they used to meet in, that they used to gather in and, and, and have celebrations in, are unfriendly. The lobby to their building is unfriendly. The ones that are sitting outside their building, at least in my particular neighborhood, in my area, with the seniors' buildings that I have. I'm not talking about the ones in Councilman and Wong's uh, ward that he visits often, I'm sure. Uh, but mine, that's the situation we've created. Stories where the person next door has befriended some folks from outside, inv invites them in, they in turn befriend the seniors. Before you know it, the senior person during the daytime and often at night is kicked out of their apartment because their units are taken up for nefariousness, whether it be prostitution, whether it be drugs, and so on. Get out there and talk to your seniors. Knock on their doors. Get into those buildings, and you'll hear those stories too. We created an absolutely deplorable situation for one of most, our most vulnerable groups that we house. This disentanglement, and I'm hoping that it becomes a disentanglement of sorts, is one of the highlights of what we're doing here. With respect to seniors housing. I know we continue to have uh, problems as it relates to resources. I know that we continue to have problems in being able to deal with, with, uh, uh, with a lot of these issues. Uh, but I'm hoping that this is a, you know, a first baby step in, uh, in disentangling a form of housing where we might be able to uh, restore some dignity uh, to those folks at the end of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're ready to vote. Our first motion is uh, by Councillor uh, Matlow, motion two. Can I get a recorded vote on that? Recorded vote. Councillor Bradford, please. <coughs> Councillor Karagiannis, please. The motion carries 19 to 5. Motion one by Councillor Cressy. All in favor? Carried. Pardon? 
Okay, record everything. Recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. And Councillor Robinson, please. The motion carries unanimously, 24 in favor. Motion three by Councillor Cole, recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Pasternak. The motion carries 21 to 3. Motion 4 by Councillor Kristen Wong to M. <clears throat> Councillor Cressy, please, and Councillor Matlow. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Cole, please. The motion carries unanimously 24 in favor. Item as amended, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Cole, please. The item is amended, carries unanimously 24 in favor. Thank you. Okay, members of council, we're getting close to lunch, and um, our next item is um, uh, the mayor's key item, which is uh, Vision Zero, um, which is on page 10. So what I would like to suggest, be, uh, there's, rather than start the item, that if members have any uh, members' releases, we can do the release of member holds and try to clear that up a bit, and then we'll do Vision Zero right after lunch. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Two things. Um, when it comes to cycling, I'm wondering whether the speaker would agree to combining item um, 6.11 and 6.12, which are both cycling items, and deal with them at the same time. Uh, are there time for after the two, uh, two uh, mayor's uh, key items? Okay. Um, does it? I, I'm simply asking that the two cycling items be, be dealt with together. And then I, I have a quick release. I think that that's okay. Okay, great. I think Thanks. we should discuss all of them at the same time. Fantastic. The cycling. That's a great okay, decision. thank you. I do have a quick release. Okay. Um, I'd be prepared to release, release um, EX. Um, what, what page? 7.26. What page, please? That's page four. Okay. And I have a motion. Okay. Uh, just this is on the Toronto Water 2019 capital budgets. Right. Just for an item uh, for consideration by staff as they plan the capital plan for 2020-2028. Mm -hmm. 
Does the staff have your motion? Uh, yes, it can go on the screen. Okay. So it's just a Toronto Water to consider this project. And, okay, and the motion is on the screen by Councillor Pasternak on EX 7.26. The amendment on favour carried. Item is amended on favour carried. Thank you. Councillor Cressy, quick item. Yes, you got it. Trees. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page 17, item TE 7.25, inclusion on the City of Toronto's Heritage Registrar 40 to 44, uh, I can release that item. Okay, on page 17, the bottom of the page, T 7.25, Councillor Cressy is releasing. On favour, carry. And I have another one, Speaker. Um, I had held, uh, on behalf of Councillor Layden, on page 11, item PH 7.2, oh. Cask Force. Zoning bylaw amendments, I believe Councillor Layden's ready to deal with it now, so I can transfer it over to him. Councillor Layton, you would like to, uh, this is on PH 7.2, correct? Councillor Layton? Uh, as it turns out, Councillor McKelvey has a question. Okay, let's and continue so we'll holding it. Thank you, let's continue holding it. Councillor Matlow. Uh, this was on page nine, and I, I'm sorry, hold on for one moment, Madam Speaker. I, I have the committee item number rather than the council item number. So um, page nine, GL 6.14, real estate acquisitions and expropriation. A property interest near the Christie subway station. I have a, a motion that was sent to clerks. Uh, this is just a, a change in wording that was written by staff to better reflect the intent to make make the point, get the information, but without actually delaying the project, and this better reflects that intent. Okay, so this is on page nine. The amendment is on the screen. GL 6.14, Councillor Matt Lowe is moving the amendment. On favor, carried. Item is amended, on favor, carried. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 4, EX 7.20, 2019 levy on railway, roadways, rights of way, and on power utility transmission distribution corridors, I have an amendment to that, which basically saying that we uh, forward this report to the uh, Ontario Good Roads Association, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Okay, on page 4. EX 7.20, Councillor Ainsley has an amendment, it's on the screen. On favour, carried. Item is amended, on favour, carried. Okay, recess to 2 o'clock. <laughs>